I'm going to make a statement. Just because you like something doesn't mean it's good. It might actually be good. But your liking it is a subjective thing and it has nothing to do with objective craft. And at this point, I would like to say, hello, Chris Bailey. How are you? Um, oh, geez. Well, you know, Mark. <laughs> you know what I mean? And hooray, hurrah for Alpha Flight. But this is what I really wanted to say. There are movies that I love that I know in, in, a, in a series of movies, for example. I'll give, I'll give a really stupid one. I love Batman and Robin. It's dumb as shit. It is absolutely a child's movie. But I absolutely adore it. It's fantastic. I'm entertained by it. I like the bright lights and the and the jittering sounds and it's and the credit cards and the nipples. Who doesn't love them? It's fantastic. I fucking I should not like Buckaroo Banzai nearly as much as I do. I fucking hate Batman Returns. I just do fight me, Dorian. My point being, um, it's like you you have angered Dorian's entire entourage. That became, you know that's that. from a previous podcast. I'm I'm just Bruce Wayne. There. Why you dress like Batman? <laughs> yeah, my point is, and it relates to Maxine. Maxine's not the best made movie. X is the best made movie out of all three of these. Um, there are elements of Pearl that are better than any one of these movies, but they're just singular elements. Like that monologue is the best thing out of all three of these movies. It's but the best made one. Objectively, the best craft of the three movies is X. There were elements of Pearl that are superior, but by and large, the thing is, as a total film, is not as well made as X. I love the shit out of Maxine. If any, if someone were to be like, what is Mark but a movie? Maxine? <laughs> it's just... Robert's comment about me, and and here's the thing. I someone once said of me, you know, he kind of saw me as like Batman because it's like the thing that defines you as a person is your sense of justice. Um, and I hold myself to that standard as I hold everybody else to it. You know, my sense of fairness, my sense of justice. Um, if you nail me dead to rights, I'm not gonna be you know, my feelings might get hurt because I am a human being, but I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. And when Robert said to me, your like sense of self and the things you were just drenched in sex, I'm like, well, you're not wrong. I fucking love the sleazy sexiness, the that, the dark underbelly stuff going on in Maxine. This is all stuff I talked about um, on movies that don't suck. That's why I love the movie so much. It, it, as an aesthetic, as a style, themes costuming the music everything about maxine i fucking love i would marry that movie if i could it is not better objectively than x it's just not and i'm a big enough man and a good enough film critic to understand there's a fucking difference between subjective i love it objective it's made or not made well so what is maxine uh not with that out of the way Maxine is a 2024 American horror film written, directed, and produced and edited by Ty West. It is the third installment of West's X, West X film series following X and Pearl, which we've been talking about for the past hour. And it serves as a direct sequel to X. Mia Goth reprises the role as Maxine Minx. It stars Elizabeth Debicki, Moses Sumney, Michelle Monaghan, Bobby Cannavale, Halsey, Lily Collins, Giancarlo Esposito, and his 80,000 billionth movie this year alone, and Kevin Bacon in his 10 zillionth movie this year. Goddamn, pal. In the film, Maxine sets out for fame and success in 1980s Hollywood while being targeted by a mysterious killer. Um, so the plot of this thing, and then uh, we'll start, we'll do... Sean Patton, Alexis Combat Cleanup. Um, the plot of this thing is basically it's, it's a few years later uh, after the whole incident at the end of Texas where Maxine got away from the house after she ran the fuck over Pearl's head. Uh, she is now trying... She's been doing porn. She's known as a porn. She's, she's a star as a porn star. But she's trying to transition into legitimate acting work. Uh, she has an agent who is Giancarlo Esposito, and where we pick up with her, she is auditioning for a role in a horror sequel. Um, there is a uh, a killer on the loose, and there, as the film goes on, there are sort of 
uh, notes about is the killer is the killer the one that's stalking Maxine? There's a, a lot of ties to that. Um, we keep getting uh, shots or flashbacks to the preacher from the first movie. Um, and someone is in fact stalking Maxine. We also have Kevin Bacon, who plays a New Orleans private eye who has come to Los Angeles to follow her around. And he's as best as this villain, as best as this movie gets, but the two thirds of it, he's the villain. Um, the cops are investigating various uh, murders of young women that are somewhat tied to Maxine. And this all comes to a head where it is revealed, ta-da, if you don't want spoilers, quick plug your ears. Um, her father has actually been killing a bunch of the young women. And he is he has decided that Hollywood took his daughter from him uh, because she has no sense of her own, her, no, no brain, just, you know, she could not defend herself from the evils of, in the devilry of Hollywood. So he's going to film her and she's going to be a star of his movie. And this is to counteract the evils of Hollywood. It doesn't go that way. She ends up killing him. Um, the cops show up. They end up dying. And at the end of all things, Maxine is, in fact, a star. The world does know her name because she's off in the world talking about what happened. Um, and I think it's alluded to that she actually becomes a movie star. Uh, I've gushed about this movie. I've spent, you know, an hour talking about it with Neil and Chris. Let me just say, it's it wasn't as good as I had hoped it was going to be. I thought it would be. I was hoping it would be even better. Um, I like I said, a lot of the a lot of the visual um, stuff in the movie is really what I liked about it. Obviously, Mia Goth, you know, performs really really well in it. The story in and of itself is a bit muddled. It's a bit jumbled. Um, it, to me, it wasn't particularly interesting at times. But I was so caught up by everything else going on in the movie, I didn't care as much. And when it was over, I was like, that was... <laughs> that was a very physically pleasing movie. I don't care that the plot's stupid. So that's kind of my thought on Maxine. Um, I'll pe pepper him some more thoughts in as you guys talk. Sean, your damn you Hollywood-esque craft review of Maxine. I would say it continues right up to the very end, the trend of each movie capturing their respective period fantastically. Yes. Um, in, in terms capital. of, yeah, it, it very much gets that bright, gaudy, kind of toxic excess yeah. of the era and just absolutely nails it to a T. So hats off. So hats off for that. I can't really say much to the story. It's it's kind of the most traditional slasher of the bunch. But then I think again, it's like the weakest part of the whole film. Yeah, but then again, I also have to consider the fact that, all due respect to Ty West and Mia Goth, Maxine was never the most interesting character of X in the first place. Um, a, a, a prequel. Yeah, you know, a, a prequel about Pearl. Yeah, that sounds in, that sounds instantly intriguing. Tell me more, by all means. Um, you tell me you've got a movie that's going to continue the story of the final girl and how she lost her way during one of the absolute seediest, most terrifying periods to try to make it in Hollywood. And eh, I don't know. If if there's nothing good on Up All Night or Monster Vision, maybe I'll maybe I'll flip the channel and catch and catch it if I can't find like a scrambled WWF pay per view or something. Um, but it's not a bad it's not a bad movie. It says something that pretty much the mo my most ambivalent of the three all also happens to outshine you know ninety percent of other recent movies. I think it's a fun um, comment on Satanic Panic. Yeah, there, there's there's absolutely that. There's the fact that this was the heart of the period when the movies and the music and eventually the video games and the comic books were absolutely all to blame for the erosion of good old west of good old Western values and and you know wholesome culture. Um, but at the same time. It kind of did speak to me in a way that the others didn't, because Mark, you've you've seen me over the past couple of years in particular. I kind of really embraced a lot of punk rock philosophies and kind of mentality, and how 
you know, I've kind of been drawn to a lot of a lot of professions and a lot of air areas from you know talk about punk rock the culinary industry the music world comics uh all of it It, they're all professions and and you know and adult content creation it all attracts people with very distinctive personality types of some form or another that just don't quite don't quite jive just don't quite assimilate really anywhere else and this really kind of captures the notion that Maxine might not necessarily have had the personality where she was cut out to survive the adult industry, but she was definitely more cut for it, more cut for it than uh, poor Pearl was. Um, it's, it's kind of a good thing that Pearl didn't get what she wished for because this is about Maxine having bit off a lot more than she could chew and the industry being more than ready as it as it does to people who are prepared for or, or at least weren't prepared for it back then to chew them up and spit them out because obviously today is very different with the advent of fans and only fans and creators having a lot more direct control over their content having fewer middlemen but back then you trusted the wrong person and it, you know you were you were prey for the entire industry so there's the horror of the slasher, and then there's you know the horrors of her profession. All right, Pat, give it to me, baby. Uh huh. Objectively, the worst <laughs> film of the three, but my absolute favorite. You're right. Hang on. Hang on. Wait. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. There we go. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Um. Because, as the first word in my little title there says schlock, it is very much an homage to a lot of schlock films that we yeah. watched on USA Up All Night with yep. Ron Shear and Gilbert Gottfried. Most particularly, a film called Angel, if you guys ever saw it. Vaguely remember uh, this. Giallo. This Giallo. All right, at least Sean's definitely seen it. But um, Angel, Angel is a movie about a prostitute who's walking the streets, and there is a serial killer preying on prostitutes. And she had this; she has this weird eclectic street family of a drag performer and an old movie cowboy and some of the other prostitutes. And the prostitutes are the ones who are being picked off, and it's up to them to stop this madman, essentially, who's killing all these prostitutes. Who's was played by John Deal from Miami Vice, who absolutely Sounds like loved a John Waters movie. Very much influenced in that vein. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's there's so much of that movie in this. Yeah. There's other elements that are homages that I love in this because essentially Maxine is a little bit of a tribute to Marilyn Chambers, mm. who went from being a very noted pornographic actress to starring in legitimate mainstream films, not the least of which was uh, Frenzy. Right. A, a tremendous horror film. Um, but you have that element to it. But again, it's it's... It's taking what it is, which, again, is very much a, an 80s B slasher slash action slash a little bit erotic thriller type movie, presenting it seriously and playing it straight while keeping the ongoing anthology of the story as it's been leading up to what we first got all the way back in X, where you hear it's Maxine's televangelist father narrating over that, the debauchery that followed, and now we've linked on come full circle all the way back to it from that yeah it, it it's smart in that sense it plays enough off of its connection to the first two movies where you can do a movie like this even though it's mm-hmm. all over the place where it wants to be a little bit noir a little bit erotic a little bit uh again b-movie schlock which i am here for trauma could have made this and it would have been awesome yeah. um hi lloyd um and anyway um but yeah, it, it, it hits so many of those notes that unlike the first two movies, which are great films respectively, no question, this isn't about being a great film. This is about being fun and tying up a lot of loose ends and potentially setting the stage for something else later on. Pat, that's been the theme of this year. So let's go back to having some fun on, on podcasts and not feel tied to any one thing. And I'll tell you, there's a parallel with film that you're that you're pointing at of, can we stop worrying about quadrants and you know cinematic universes and all this other bullshit and just go back to 
the fun of making movies. Yeah, it would be nice if they made money too, but maybe if you made a fun movie, people would come to the movies and have fun and you'd make money. And Not Ty West some... Ty West got the message. Right. And again, look at West's budget for the first. Yeah. Kid Cudi is in that because he's a producer and they couldn't and they had they had trouble casting people as a whole. They had to really expand a lot of their budget towards Jenna Ortega, not for nothing. And it was the right call, obviously, because she attracts right. an audience. She is very much seen as a screen queen of the modern age. So, yeah, get somebody who's going to put a couple of butts every 18 inches. So at least if this works on some level, you have potential for more. And that was a gamble that paid off and paid off again. And Maxine, if I'm not mistaken, did excellent box office numbers as well, even though by that point in time, everybody knew that this was not going to be on the same level artistically. It made $22 maybe, million. Dollars. I have no idea what the budget was. It's a shoestring budget. And that's, again, part of the success because they're not throwing $500 million into the production of this where you have to make a billion to just break even. You know, there's there's some sensibility with the filmmaking that's been done through these three. Uh, they're very hands-on. And again, A24 is really going back to the idea of scale things back, make it simple, and then it'll work. Okay. I just asked my girlfriend, uh, ChatGPT, the budget was reported to be the range of $2 million. It, exactly. So, X. So, 22, so let's just put that in perspective. As we talk about a damn you Hollywood, and Alexis has now heard this ad nauseum, um, if you d- double your production budget or more, you're a success – the champagne and caviar um imdb says made... it was one million okay 20 times its budget like th- th- are, are you kidding me they're gonna throw ty west a fucking parade like like these days and i don't want to trigger pat here and have him have like a flashback or anything so try to are you gonna reference your... canon films i'm no i was gonna have marvel the people at fucking marvel at this point are you kidding me 20 times the budget they you know <laughs> they, they they would light the streets on fire instead of jumping out the window as they're currently doing. No, but A- A24 is the workable version of canon where they right. film things on a shoestring budget, but instead of just making really bad shit and selling it ahead of time, they're actually oh. putting quality into the work they have. <laughs> A24, and- we'll make everything and see what happens. Well, I mean, er- early, in, early in his career, that was kind of what Robert Rodriguez became notorious for. Yeah. was not necessarily even the sheer spectacle of his movies, but the fact that everything that he made came in on time, and on under time. budget, and even when he didn't necessarily have the resources, he could make a million dollars look like five. Yeah, that was the and you just kind of and you just kind of trusted him, and to this day, including making one of the best predators predator movies. He just never lets you down in that regard. He is an ACDC album. You go to see a Robert Rodriguez movie, you know what you're going to get, you know what to expect, you know what you want, and you, and you get it. Okay, keep going, Pat. You walk, away, maybe, you walk away, maybe not blown away, but definitely satisfied. Keep going, Pat. Right, because again, it's just – it's basic principle of success for profitability. Start with low overhead, and they've done that. <laughs> right. And, Don't start and, at $300 million. Yeah, and, and again, there's been so much commitment to the continuity of the anthology, which is mm-hmm. giving you a lot more leeway than if you had to produce direct sequels each time. Right. There's a little bit more free flow with the story where you can world build to a certain extent and character direct, but you have the freedom that each movie really is its own encompassed world, where if they were standalones, they'd all make sense without you seeing it. Maybe you don't pick up on the Easter eggs involved. Maybe you don't right. pick up on some of the things there, but each movie is also self-contained on top of being part of this greater anthology, and they all work in that respect, and they all work in a different way. You know, the the first one is essentially like, – we're going to na- make it a nod to anything. We'll call it the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The second one is almost a nod to Carrie if Carrie was really unsympathetic, <laughs> where, you know, mm-hmm. where let's say she just started using the telekinesis right off the bat because she was upset that, you know, her mom was talking about her dirty pillows, whatever, Okay. But essentially, it is a trip into madness that descends with ultimately evil pers- winning out, and you know, yeah. And then this one to me, Angel is the biggest, the biggest comparison I can draw because it's very much a bigger budgeted, played more seriously version of Angel, mm. but with a very similar premise, result, and execution. Ultimately, though, because it's on a bigger scale with a more, what's the word I'm looking for? a more well-developed process behind it where the original angel, I think it shot in like 20 days on Hollywood Boulevard, right. you know, Dr. this Rapunzel, was Pat. 
yeah, this was well done and start to finish taking something that's beloved in a certain respect, playing it straight and serious, continuing a world build and mm -hmm. setting the stage for more potentially. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Alexis, give me your craft review of Maxine. Take me home, baby doll. I am in the minority here because this was my least favorite of the three. It was a good oh. movie. <laughs> Sorry, come on. keep going. <laughs> There were a lot of elements that I liked. I love Kevin Bacon as Labatt. I love the chase scene on the Universal Studios lot with him and Mia Goth. I think my biggest problem with this movie was I felt that they established a lot but didn't really follow through with it. There was a lot of elements that were kind of dabbled into, but I felt that they were not given enough time and focus to become really that big of a deal. Yeah, Again, all we're talking are true, by the way. I 100% agree with you. Yeah, I mean, again, they talk about the state. You, you mentioned the satanic panic of the mm -hmm. 80s, and I'm absolutely there with you. I've noticed that that's kind of become a recurring theme with a lot of horror and horror-esque uh, film and TV lately. We've been seeing that in things like Stranger Things and Late Night with the Devil. So I guess that's kind of becoming like the new big trend in, uh, I don't know, in retro horror. But I felt that even then I was like, they didn't really go a lot with go very far with it. Yeah, I, he, he, it's like he's like, look, this existed and says nothing about it. Exactly. I and it's a weird thing because we talked about how, you know, Pearl is the main character of her film, but we don't know that Maxine is the main character of X. She's obviously the main character of her self-titled film, but I really was not a fan that we don't get to know a lot of these other characters. Yeah. It just, uh, with the exception of the uh, producer that Elizabeth Debicki. Uh, they're plays, not really playing characters. They're playing genres. Exactly. There like are said, archetypes. I, yeah. I think Elizabeth Debicki and uh, Kevin Bacon get the most development of their characters. Um, I would completely disagree with Karen, ba Kevin Bacon. Karen Bacon. Kevin Bacon is playing an accent. Okay, Elizabeth fine, fair enough. is playing a character and she's the only one with anything substantial to say in this movie. Yeah, I mean, we see two of uh, Maxine's friends get killed off in the first, what, third of the movie? Yeah. But we know so little about them that when we see them being tied up and threatened, it doesn't hit us that much. Right. So I'm not, it was still an enjoyable film for the most part. And yeah, I'm not going to say like, oh, I hated it. Obviously, I didn't. But it is at the bottom for me of this trilogy. Wrapping up this, this whole... This is ahead, Seinfeld Max, where Elaine hates the English patient and wants to see sack lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the money pit. 